Can everyone hear me? Yes? Cool. Um, just wave if you can't hear me at some time during the talk. All right. Um, let's get started. So um, I'm Ryan Levick. Uh, you can find me at Itchy Ankles on, on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about um, creating a Game Boy emulator in Rust. Oh, I touched something. Cool, it's back. All right. So the first thing we have to talk about is what is emulation. Um, hopefully everybody is familiar with this thing. This is the original Game Boy um, from like 1989. Um, and the Goal of emulation is to basically create this piece of hardware in software. But before we get into the details of how to do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about my story. Um, so I'm a web programmer originally, mostly working on the back end. I've also done a lot of front end development. Um, I studied marketing, so I don't have a computer science background. So basically what I want to tell you with all of this is I'm not any kind of genius. It's when I first started working on emulation, I thought this is probably a very hard problem. It's not really. So I encourage all of you to take a look at it um, because it's a lot of fun. And at the end, you get to play games, which is pretty cool. Um, so the first thing uh, that when I started on my journey was kind of looking for what can I emulate? I want to create an emulator because it sounds like a cool project. Um, what should I start with? And I thought maybe I start with a Nintendo 64 because I played that as a kid or a PlayStation. Well, those are kind of hard. So let's start a little bit simple. And I started with the Chip 8. Um, and if anybody is uh, not familiar with the Chip 8, it's a computer from the 1970s. Very simple. Kind of looked like this when you were playing with it. Can play things like Pong and Breakout and stuff like that. And it's a very simple architecture. So if you want to start with something and the Game Boy seems like a little bit of a big leap for you, I would suggest starting with the Chip 8 first. So now that we have that covered, what do we actually have to do to emulate the Game Boy? And there are a couple of major parts to, to emulation. Um, for instance, we have the CPU, which is kind of like the brains of the, of the computer. We have memory, we have graphics, and we have a whole bunch more that I won't even touch on, like sound, input, stuff like that. And unfortunately, this is only 30 minutes long, um, and I'm not that good. So, um, so this is going to be our goal for uh, today, is to get this working. This is the, when you turn on the Game Boy, the Nintendo logo scrolls down. Um, we won't get to the da ding unfortunately, because that's sound. But uh, I'll leave that up to you as some homework. So let's start kind of at the top of the stack, the thing that you as the player get to see. We'll start with graphics. And the first thing that we have to talk about is the tiling system. So when you look at the background um, of the game, what you'll actually be looking at is a grouping of tiles. Um, so the Game Boy does not manipulate pixel by pixel, but rather creates these 8x8 pixel tiles, and then you arrange those 8x8 pixel tiles on the screen. And so here on the left, we can see the tile set, which is kind of your, your 8x8 tiles that you can use as building blocks to build your graphics. And then on the right is the background, and you basically just map tile to some place on the background. So let's take a little bit closer look at that. We'll kind of zoom in on one part of the tile set and some corresponding pieces, interesting pieces of the background. So you can see what the tile set looks like. Um, it's just kind of these, these eight by eight pixel chunks right here. And they're usually in memory numbered, zero to, in this case, 47. There's um, around 300 of them. Um, and so they, you know, literally go through memory. Uh, the first tile in this tile set happens to be all white pixels. Um, then after that is the kind of top uh, left of the end and so on. And then what we're going to do is in our background, we're going to uh, map from a tile to a place in the background. So the first square there is going to be tile one. To the very right, you see the little like uh, R on, on the top there, that's tile 25. Um, below that is tile zero. So we're mapping from tiles in our, uh, in our tile set to the actual background. So if you take a look at something like this, this is Tetris right here and a very poorly played game of Tetris. That's my fault, sorry about that. Um, you can see we have a tile set which is much more complicated than a Nintendo Logo one that has all kinds of things in it. And the background 
um, is just kind of composed of all of those tiles. Um, and we just need to know this and be able to emulate this. It's not our job to actually do the composition. That's the programmer's job. And you know, we're not the game programmer. We're just allowing the game to actually do that. You might be asking, though, wait a second. When we look at the Tetris thing, we've got all this white space next to uh, the actual game. What's going on with that? And the answer is, is that the background is actually much larger than the display screen on the device itself. So what we have to do is also emulate a viewport on top of that window. And you can look what that looks like when you're actually scrolling uh, the Nintendo logo. So the, I was amazed when I first saw this. It turns out that the Nintendo logo isn't actually scrolling down, but the viewport is scrolling up, which boom, blew my mind. <laughs> So let's, let's dive into a little bit of code. And again, this is going to be high level because unfortunately we only have 30 minutes. But it should give you a rough idea of how you could model this in Rust. So here we have a GPU struct. Um, and we're going to have something like a tile set. And it's going to be, again, 384 tiles. And these tiles are just 8 by 8 pixels. So it's kind of, uh, you can think of it as a, you know, a, a, an array, for instance. Um, and then we have video RAM. And that, is, that includes things like our background. I mean, it also include things like sprites and stuff like that. But um, for now, it's just the background. Um, and then the last thing is our canvas buffer. And what that is going to be is just what we're going to take from the tile set and the video RAM and compose them together to actually display it onto the screen. So the tile set is something that the game code that your, your emulator is running will manipulate. The video RAM is also something the game code will manipulate. But the canvas buffer is something that we, in the background, are manipulating so that we display something actually to the user of our emulator. So now that we have kind of a rough idea of how you might model uh, a graphics and only a high level one, let's talk a little bit about memory. So it's important to remember that uh, memory is just one very, very long array. And it's full of bytes. That's all it is. So if you're thinking about how this is very, very complicated, it's not. It's really just an array. And it has unsigned 8-bit integers in it. And that's it. And it's really the clever use of game code. Um, people much smarter than myself in the 80s and the 90s who created these games to manipulate that long array of bytes that are actually doing the cool stuff that you see on the screen. So let's take a little bit closer of a look at, at the memory map that we have. What does this array of bytes actually contain? Well, the first half of it is ROM code. That's kind of the code that gets run automatically by the Game Boy to boot up. Um, it also includes your game cartridge code. So when you stick a cartridge into the Game Boy, that move, the, the Game Boy automatically moves the game cartridge code into this first half of your long array. Um, and we also have video RAM here. And you can think of we're kind of already emulating in that inside of our, uh, with our GPU struct. So that's taken care of there. We have work RAM. That's uh, RAM that the game can use to kind of um, do whatever it needs to do. And we have other stuff as well that I'm not getting to. So uh, places to define what the, the window size is and things like that. Um, but we won't get to that today. Um, so you can imagine that we would have a struct called memory bus. And that memory bus contains that super long array. And it's actually, again, just an array of unsigned 8-bit integers that's 0x f f f f long. And that's how much memory the Game Boy had. Um, it's actually not how much memory the Game Boy had. It's how much the, the Game Boy could address in memory. So um, uh, an address space of 16 bits, if that makes sense. Um, and of course, we have our GPU uh, along with that. And so when we're, we're implementing our, our memory bus, you might want to have um, a function, for instance, called read byte. And what does that read byte do? It takes an address, which is an unsigned 16-bit integer, um, and it returns back the byte at that address. And we'll have to do a little bit of logic here, like, OK, if the address is greater than the beginning of video RAM, but less than the end of video RAM, let's go ahead and read from our GPU RAM. And otherwise, we'll go ahead and read from that very long array instead. And actually, when we add more and more subsystems, like sound and things like that, we're just going to have a big old like if else or match statement that basically says, OK, if it's this part of memory, go to this subsystem. If it's this part of memory, go to that subsystem. And, and that's how it works. And lastly, what we're going to have then is 
the CPU, so the kind of overarching brains of the computer, and that holds on to the bus. So the CPU can talk through the bus to the GPU. But the CPU has one more thing along with it. It has something called a program counter. And what the program counter does is it's basically just a number that indicates where in memory you're currently executing. So we can take a look at the program counter here. Currently, our program counter is set to zero. If we go ahead and execute that instruction at zero and move forward, it will jump to uh, instruction at address two. Then it jumps to address four. Maybe it then, you know, that instruction is a jump and it jumps over to address nine and maybe then it jumps to address 19. And that's all you're doing is keeping track of what is the currently executed instruction. And we'll look at what executing instructions actually looks like in a second. So now we know, okay, our, struct, our CPU struct is pretty simple. It's got a program counter and it's got a memory bus and that's about it. So that's great. Let's take a little bit closer look at the CPU itself. And the first thing that we need to look at is instructions. So we have our program counter. We're reading a byte in from memory of an instruction that we want to um, execute. But what we probably want to do is interpret that byte as an actual instruction. So we have this, in, this uh, function called from byte on, our, uh, on an instruction uh, struct or an instruction enum. Um, and what from byte does is take that unsigned 8-bit integer and decodes it as an instruction. So for instance, uh, 0x02 uh, decodes as an increment on the BC target. So that's just what, what it is. It's just an instruction. We'll look at specifically some instructions that we have. So then it, now that we have instructions, what we need to do is go ahead and execute them. So we're going to look at this step function on the CPU that goes ahead and um, executes instructions. And the way that an emulator works, the way that a CPU works, is it basically just loops infinitely and calls step. Executing one instruction at a time, going to the next, and going, 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 forever and ever and ever, unless the program calls halt or the Game Boy explodes or whatever. So the first thing um, in our step instruction is just, it's going to, our, our step function is it's going to take mutable, mutable reference to self. Um, it's then going to read a byte from the bus um, at the program counter. It's then going to decode that byte as an instruction. Okay, so we have an instruction now, that's great. We're going to execute that instruction and the execution what it's going to do is return us back the next program counter that we're at. So for most instruction, that's probably uh, two, um, two bytes further on in memory. But if it's a jump, it could be literally anywhere. Um, it can jump to anywhere in memory. And of course, then we're going to set uh, the program counter to that next program counter. OK, so now that we understand how, um, how things get executed, let's talk a little bit about registers. And what registers are, are the kind of smallest pieces of memory that we have inside of, of the computer. They're little tiny unsigned 8-bit integers that sit right next, right on the CPU. And that's what the CPU actually ends up manipulating. So the CPU can fetch things from memory, it can do something to the contents of the register, and then it can write back out to memory. And really, that's about all it can do. So our CPU instruction execution is actually pretty simple. It's gonna be just some simple math operations. And so these things might look like this. Um, and we might, we might go ahead and model it like this. This is pretty straightforward. We have a, a register struct. It's got an unsigned 8-bit integer for each of our, our registers. They happen to be called A, B, C, D, E, F, H, and L. That's just the way that they were called. It's not because I can't name things. Um, and so our CPU looks a little bit different now, right? It just has registers on it. And let's take a look um, specifically at some instructions that might, we might want to execute. So we're going to look at one instruction. Um, it's the add instruction. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and it has a couple of targets. And what the add instruction will do is it looks at the target. So if the target, let's say, is D, register D, it will take the contents of register D it will add it to the contents of register A, and then it will store it back into register A. And so no matter what the target is, it just takes it, 
puts it, uh, adds it with the register A, and then writes it back into register A. And if you're thinking, that sounds pretty simple, it is. It's like one line of code. So what we have to do now is actually execute our instruction. So what we're going to look at here is execute on the CPU, and it's going to take a mutable reference to self, and an instruction that's going to actually execute the instruction. And so first it needs to figure out what instruction it's dealing with, right? So we match on the instruction, and in this case, we're gonna, if, if it happens to be an add instruction, and the target is the C register, what we're going to do then is uh, take the value, and I just noticed now we don't have the value, we get the value from uh, the C register, we write it, uh, we wrap wrapping add to register A, and what wrapping add does is it just makes sure that the, um, if it goes above 255, which is the maximum that an unsigned 8-bit integer can represent, it just wraps around to zero again and goes from there. And we're going to then write that back into register A. Pretty simple. And so we have a whole bunch of instructions here. We've got add, sub, uh, bitwise and, bitwise or, bitwise xor. Maybe if you're familiar with bitwise, uh, like, uh, bitwise operations, you know what these are. If not, they're pretty easy to learn. Um, you have inc, which adds one to something, dec, which takes one away, and some more. And this is by no means exhaustive. Um, so when you're writing uh, an emulator, this is probably the most boring part of the entire thing because you're just going to be doing this for like 200 instructions. Um, but it gets much more fun after that. So the last thing we're going to do today is make it run. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to use a crate um, called Rust Mini FB. Um, and what this allows you to do is it gives you a window and it gives you something called a frame buffer, which again is just a big uh, array of bytes that you can write to, and it will display those bytes on the screen. So you can write to it. Uh, the, if you write, you know, 12 to the first uh, byte there or the first three bytes, it displays that pixel to the screen. And so it allows us to easily get up and running and write something, uh, write an actual window. So this is a big chunk of code that we've got to get working. The first line here is uh, it takes a CPU and it takes a window. And we're going to get some stuff set up here. So we have our, our window buffer um, that we're going to write to. Um, we have some housekeeping for how many cycles of the CPU, how many times we run the, the run function. Um, and we have some timing stuff. So what is right now? And basically, we're going to be running this code forever while the window is open and while you didn't hit the escape key. Sounds pretty good. And so the first thing we do is do some time tracking to see, OK, how much time has passed since we last were here? Um, and then we kind of write now back into the now function. So we've, we're just trying to keep track of how much time has passed since the last time. Then we go ahead and call run on the CPU when we pass in this time delta. And the CPU just knows how many instructions, how many times to call step for that amount of time. And the Game Boy has a very well-specified amount of time that it's allowed to run. And we get back how many cycles have actually uh, passed, how many cycles have been run. And we add that to our cycles elapsed in frame. And what we do there is we just check, OK, have we run um, more cycles than should happen in one frame. And by frame, I mean showing something to the user. And that happens uh, 30 seconds, uh, 30 times per second. Um, and if we, if we have, then we go ahead and copy our, our pixel buffer from our, our GPU that we had, and we put it into our window buffer. And then we write it to our window, um, and then we reset cycles elapsed in frame. And this will just display uh, the thing to the user. Pretty straightforward. And otherwise, we sleep for a little while because Rust is so fast um, and your computer is so much faster than, than a Game Boy was that if you don't do that, it will just explode because it can't handle it. And if we do that, we did it. We have accomplished something. So give ourselves a round of applause. So, <laughs> so we should all feel pretty proud of ourselves today. But uh, admittedly, I might have skipped over a couple of things. Um, it wasn't exactly an exhaustive uh, review of how to do this. So you might be wondering, OK, I want to go home, and I want to try this out for myself. What are some resources that I can do to go ahead and get better at this? 
Um, one of the first ones here is a, a talk by Michael Stahl, which is a, a talk called the Ultimate Game Boy Talk, and it really goes into super technical depth very fast, much faster than I talked about the Game Boy. And so if you want to just get a whirlwind tour of the technical aspects of a Game Boy, go for this. The next one is something called the Pandox. Um, these are really thorough technical documentation on, uh, on the Game Boy. Um, and it's really great if you have a question. Um, more than likely, if you can't find it here, you probably won't find it unless you'll find a random blog post somewhere online. Um, so this is a really good first stop. The next one is what, how I got started, was reading this uh, blog post series called Game Boy Emulation in JavaScript. Um, and it's really great. It's not in Rust, obviously, but um, if you're familiar with JavaScript, it's good to kind of uh, read through this and get an idea of how you might model it in JavaScript, at least. Then if you're looking for something more rusty, um, we have uh, a, um, a repo here um, that implements um, a Game Boy in Rust. Um, and the great thing about this is that it's meant to be extremely accurate. So if you have any questions about how you should be emulating a Game Boy, you should look here, because um, the, the awesome thing about this project is they have literally taken um, a physical Game Boy, created test ROMs for it, stuck them into the Game Boy, tried it out doing weird things that no one would ever consider to do in an actual game, and see what happens, and then they emulate that inside of it. So not only will this thing easily run Tetris, Pokemon, whatever you want. It will also run any program that you happen to write in Game Boy uh, Assembly as well, because it's uh, as accurate, it tries to be as accurate as it possibly can. So really what it comes down to is, this was all kind of a, a pain for me. There's a lot of, I, I kind of gave you the shortcut on resources here of where to go if you, um, if you need to find uh, things, but it took me a long time to find those sites. Those are by no means everything that you will need to implement this. Um, so, but just because it was a pain for me doesn't mean it has to be a pain for you. Um, what's exciting about emulating a Game Boy is not trying to find documentation online. That's the bad part about building a Game Boy emulator. The exciting part is actually building it. Um, and so with that, what I've gone ahead uh, is created a book, because that's what we do in the Rust community. Um, about how to build a Game Boy emulator in Rust. Uh, and what this is, is really tries to be the, uh, the resource for being able to build a Game Boy emulator in Rust. And it goes much, much slower than I did today and in much more detail. And the great thing about writing it in Rust as well is that you can compile it to WebAssembly. And so I did that and I built myself a nice little um, Game Boy uh, thing here. It's got some really great um, debugging tools and there's more of this to come as well. Um, so if you're interested, if this looks really cool to you and you want to help out to make something very accessible so that other people can um, build Game Boys and have fun with them, um, then I say, let's learn together. Thank you. Questions? I guess you have some. Two maximum, okay. Other than writing a book, do you have like a, a GitHub repo or something like that with the code for your emulator? Yes, I do. Um, so it's github.com slash rylev, R-Y-L-E-V, slash DMG01. DMG01 was the code name for the Game Boy. Um, so if you forget it, just go to the Wikipedia page and look up what the code name for the Game Boy was while they were developing it, and you'll, you'll be able to remember it. Um, but yeah, I have the code there. Um, the emulator is, this is actually my second attempt at writing the emulator. The first attempt I did was in TypeScript. Um, and uh, that one is a bit further along. So the one currently can only uh, run test ROMs, it can't yet run Tetris, but I'm like very close to being able to do that. And since I've already done it, if you wanna do it yourself and need my help, I would be more than happy to take you through um, and we can get it running Tetris, uh, which is quite a lot of fun. Thank you very much.
So, sure. Hi, uh, great talk. So I have a kind of useless question. Uh, have you tried like optimizing the performance of this and then removing the uh, you know the slow time to see how 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 fast can you like you know time wrap the Game Boy game? Um, I have not tried to optimize it, but I have. I mean, before when I first ran, I uh, wrote that run code. I didn't have the sleep in there, um, and it it goes really fast. So you will see things like the the screen just kind of going, zzz, and then and then eventually it just kind of gets out of sync and stuff like that. And um, yeah, you need to you need to slow it down for it to be usable in any way. Okay, then. If we don't have any other questions, I'll pass the microphone to Florian. Thank you.